Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, scholarly memory advantage, I go by Maz, and I have for, for many years, uh, test pilot in the, in the RAF. And right now, I'm not working as a test pilot, I'm working as a, as a maritime surveillance pilot and a flight commander at uh, number 10 squadron uh, based in Adelaide. I've been very, very fortunate in my life uh, to live a life that's allowed me to pursue two loves, science and flying, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of that with you here tonight. So, I'll start off with what it is that I do, and, and what you'll see in the presentation tonight is a whole lot of pictures and a whole lot of, oh, a little bit of video, and I'll weave a story around those. So, what is it that I do? I fly airplanes that look like this. Um, this is a great love of my life. This is the AP-3C Orion, um, the maritime patrol aircraft that I started flying in 2007, and I still fly today. A magnificent airplane that's taken me all around the world. It's actually, um, it's not a new airplane, and it's not obviously not a fast, uh, a fast fighter jet, but it is one of the coolest airplanes um, ever designed, in my opinion. And uh, the more airplanes I've flown, and now that count is well over 30, the more I appreciate just how magnificent this airplane really is. We can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this is what I look like when I fly this airplane. And uh, one of the coolest things about flying Orions is that you get to roll as a crew around the world. And you sort of get that from this photo. Every once in a while, I get to fly airplanes that look like this. So this is the F-15E Strike Eagle, uh, another absolutely magnificent machine that I was privileged to fly when I was uh, flying in the US. It's actually the only aircraft that's ever seriously challenged how I perceive gravity works. And I'll, I'll tell you that story in a little bit. And this is what I look like when I fly this particular aeroplane. And you'll note the uh, RAF ensign on the, on the left shoulder. That's, that's definitely me. Uh, what you can't see under the oxygen mask is the almost demented green, because this airplane is so much fun to fly. And uh, after this sortie, when I got back to the schoolhouse, the first person I came across was the chief test pilot, uh, or the test pilot school. And his first words to me were, what's wrong with your face? <laughs> um, because I had this, like I said, almost demented grin. Uh, and when I said to him, oh, I just flew the striking, he said, oh, OK, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so it's an absolute honor to be here. And I'd like to thank Crestacon for giving me this, uh, this opportunity. And the reason I love, I love being here, it's actually a couple of reasons. So the starters, don't believe the cool pictures. First and foremost, I'm a massive science nerd. I uh, always have been, I always will be, and uh, there's, there's actually a smattering of people who have known me through the years in this audience. They can all confirm this. Um, at, at school, I was the girl that loved maths and physics, that incessantly talked about astronomy and cosmology, and uh, I don't know if I should admit this, but um, during my high school years in New Zealand, I, uh, I attended the Maths Olympiad camps, you know, where you go away for a week and you spend six to eight hours a day doing mathematics. Um, so that was me as a teenager, and I vividly remember my first trip to Questacon, it was in 1999. I was a very moody 17-year-old, and I came here with my dad. Um, suffice to say, the science-loving nerd Maz was stronger than the moody teenager Maz, and I reverted back to being a kid in a candy store for at least a few hours. So that's why it's so great to be here, of all places. Secondly, tonight I get to talk about a couple of things I love. So I get to talk about science and I get to talk about aeroplanes. And I can only hope it will be as much fun for you guys um, as it's going to be for me. So let me start with a little bit on uh, how I got here. And I'm not going to rehash most of, uh, of that lovely introduction, thank you very much. Um, I was born in Eastern Europe and that's why the name is spelled weirdly. And it's one of the banes of my existence, that, that spelling. Um, moved to New Zealand in 1995, and there'll be at least a few people in the audience who remember that that was not a particularly good time to be, uh, to be leaving Eastern Europe, so I was very pleased to end up in this part of the world. Uh, then moved to Canberra, where I let my inner nerd shine at ADFA and studied maths and physics and loved every day of it. Um, I started flying in 2005 on this little bird, so this is the CT4B, uh, and the, the RAF actually still uses this aircraft as a basic trainer for its pilots, although not for much longer. You'll know there's only one, that cockpit holds two people. There's only one in there at the moment, that's me about to go on my first solo. Um, and this is, this is the other view of that uh, very exciting time for a young 22-year-old man. 
On graduating from the from the CT4, uh, the RAF's young pilots moved to the PC9, and you'll have to excuse the quality of this photo. This was actually taken on a film camera from a moving aeroplane and then scanned in. Uh, that tells you about how long ago it was. It was uh, 2006. Um, and this is a photo of a Thunderbird, which is a formation of 26 PC9s that fly over Perth to mark uh, the graduation of a pilot's course. And this is sort of what one looks like when one is uh, flying PC9 during a Thunderbird. And if you have a close look at that visor, you'll be able to see all the other aeroplanes as pixelated as they are. So from there, I went on to uh, the world of maritime and my great life, the P3. Um, this magnificent aircraft and, and the work we did with it took me to all sorts of awesome places, including places that look like this. This is uh, Cocos Keeling Island, the Indian Ocean, where uh, I've spent a lot of my time, and also places that look like this. So this is the wing of my aeroplane over Afghanistan in 2010 on one of the, the three Middle East tours I've done. It also allowed me to, to captain a, a crew of 13 magnificent aviators uh, and fly with them all over the world which is a rare and amazing both privilege and responsibility and it's, and it's all the bigger when you do it as a 27 year old. So the way it basically works at Maritime is you get there, you have a couple of years of on the job training and then if you pass all the tests and you prove yourself to be good enough, they basically say, here Maz, here are the keys, take this hundred million dollar airplane and these 13, 14, 15 people, take them to different places in the world and bring them back safe. And for, a, for me, that happened when I was 27. Um, for a 27-year-old woman, that was just an amazing thing to be doing. And I loved every minute of it. So from there, in 2012, I was selected to become a test pilot. And in 2013, I ended up here at the United States Air Force Test Pilot School in California. Um, we already mentioned the fact that nobody from Australia had gone there for a while. So it was 23 years since somebody from Australia had been sent there and I ended up being the first in 25 to graduate from there. Now as educational institutions go, this is a pretty prestigious one. It's been around for 70-ish uh, for 70, oh, 70 years. Um, and in that time, it's uh, graduated less than 3,000 graduates, a high proportion of whom have gone on to become astronauts and other cool things like that. Um, it's located at Edwards Air Force Base which has a very important place in aviation history. Um, it's where the sun barrier was first broken in 1947. It's where the space shuttle used to land. Now, Edwards is perched on the edge of, you can see it there, a big dry lake bed. And that lake bed is so hard that when the space shuttle used to land on it, it just used to scuff the surface, not crack it. And uh, as you can see, there are a whole bunch of sort of runways marked on it. Uh, they're, they're marked in big, thick oil lines. And uh, that's what makes Edwards uniquely awesome for flight test, because all in all, it has about 40 runways in addition to the two that, uh, that you can see there as primaries. So for an aeroplane nerd like me, just being at Edwards was a real, uh, real dream come true. And then the course was something else again. So during the course, um, I flew 23 different, uh, different kinds of aeroplanes in the 48 weeks I was there, and studied very hard for that master's degree in flight test engineering. Um, as well as the experimental test pilot qualification, and the, the breadth of what you study is, ju is just huge. Now, the cool stuff isn't what you study, it's the aeroplanes you fly. So we flew aeroplanes that look like this. I know you've seen this photo before, but it's cool enough to put up again. <laughs> um, so the, the F-15, and uh, I told you this is the only aeroplane that's ever bent my idea of gravity, so I might as well tell you that story now. Um, we're doing a, uh, a test profile with an asymmetric load. So imagine this aeroplane with one big bomb shape under one wing and nothing under the other wing. And what we were doing in technical terms is called speed soaking the store. But what it was actually, it was just mucking around and about Mark 0.95 at low level contouring the terrain, which is really, really all kinds of cool. Um, and then the, uh, the guy that was flying in the back seat said to me, OK, I just want you to kick it into afterburner and just point the nose up and let's get up to 40,000 feet to do the next bit of the, of the profile. I thought, oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. I'd been flying the F-16 for a while by this point. That's cool. I know how to do this. Of course, this beast is much more powerful than an F-16. So, and I was already sitting at about Mark 0.9, Mark 0.95, so just below the speed of sound. And uh, I kicked the aeroplane into full afterburner. And you can actually feel each successive stage light off and sort of kick you in the backside. And uh, as I started to raise the nose at a rate that I thought was appropriate based on my F-16 experience, I heard the, um, 
the safety pilot in the back sort of call out more, 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 and I ended up having to pull over 4G to point, point the nose almost straight up so it wouldn't go supersonic in the climb. And uh, we got to 40,000 feet in what seemed like seconds, and um, I, I honestly don't know how, how long it was because my gyros had completely toppled at that point. And I asked him if we, could just, if we could just hang out for about 15 seconds until I realigned what gravity felt like. That's how awesome this machine is. So that's the F-15. Um, everything from this to this, so stepping back some, what is it, some 50 years to the, to the Korean War. So this is the, uh, the MiG-15, um, a Russian aeroplane, and you really can't script this stuff. So here is an Eastern European-born Yovanovitch flying a Russian MiG off an American um, ramp in 2013. Yeah, you can't script it. So MiG-15 is a, is a wonderfully idiosyncratic aeroplane which has some very interesting flying qualities that uh, you wouldn't design into an aeroplane if, uh, if you had the choice. Um, what it did teach me, though, is that the pilots who flew these in the Korean War, the Russian pilots, must have been uh, absolutely magnificent at what they did. So from the MiG-15 to another Russian bird, this is the uh, AN-2 Colt, which is the world's biggest biplane, and they actually still make these, believe it or not. There's about 10,000 of them flying around the world, uh, and the reason they still make them is because they're really good at lifting heavy loads short distances, and they're almost impossible to break. So there's a whole bunch of them flying around, particularly China and Mongolia and places like that. Uh, what we did with this guy is we bunny hopped him around uh, the dry lake beds in the, uh, in the Californian high desert, and it was awesome fun from Russian biplanes to an aeroplane. And I, I apologize for all the photos of me, but that's how I ended up with the photos of the aeroplanes. After, after the sortie, you end up getting a hero shot, and uh, you just look through me to the extra 300 behind me. So the extra 300 is an aeroplane that's actually, that would be familiar to a lot of people. It's the aeroplane, one of the aeroplanes that they fly in the Red Bull Air Race. Um, and because of the way it's designed and built, this aircraft can actually do positive and negative 10G. For, uh, for comparison, F-18 Hornet uh, tops out at about positive seven and a half and about minus three. So it's not quite that simple, but, uh, but that's good enough for comparison. Um, what I can tell you is I've been up to positive nine and that's not a huge deal, but negative really, really hurts. So um, I've flown some outside loops in this little aeroplane uh, at sustained minus four and a half and negative four and a half G for uh, even a few seconds basically makes your eyeballs not sit in your head right for the next couple of days. And the other thing that happens is you, you really have to lose any sense of vanity you ever had. So after flying this aeroplane and sustaining negative G for extended periods, I ended up looking like a panda. I ended up having all these uh, broken blood vessels around my eyes uh, because that's what negative G does. It pushes all the blood up to your head. And finally, um, and it's not the last aeroplane shot I'll show you, it's just the last of this lot. Um, the HU-16 Albatross, another wonderfully idiosyncratic aeroplane, uh, a seaplane this time, and this photo looks a little bit different. There's a good reason for that. This was taken uh, a couple of hours after we crashed this aeroplane onto Lake Mead, um, so about 30 miles south of Las Vegas, uh, and we crashed it in a way that tore off the main landing gear door on the left-hand side. Um, and we ended up having to exit and return to our air base via different means. So that was my last experience in the HU-16. The main reason and the whole idea behind flying so many different aeroplanes during test pilot training is, is really twofold. Uh, firstly, it's to teach you a couple of things. Um, it's to teach you that all aircraft, regardless of whether they look like the HU-16 or the, or the F-15, and I should qualify that, or fixed-wing aircraft. I know there's a couple of helicopter lovers around here. Uh, all fixed-wing aircraft are essentially the same, and they need the same things to go flying. You need to know the same things about them to take them flying. And the other thing they're trying to teach you is to, be, uh, to get comfortable being uncomfortable. They, uh, they need to teach you how to understand and deal with aircraft you haven't flown before, because that sort of becomes your lifeblood as, uh, as a test pilot. So what is a test pilot and, uh, and what does a test pilot do? So a test pilot is an aviator with some specific training. Um, they're basically trained to fly new or heavily modified aeroplanes to make sure they're safe and to work out how they behave before they get handed off to, uh, to line pilots. Now that can mean anything from brand new aeroplanes um, to aeroplanes that have had new systems added to the inside of the aeroplane 
or that have had stuff stuck onto the outside of the aeroplane, like stores, etc. Uh, it can mean aircraft that have never done air-to-air -air refueling before, so that's something new we have to try. Uh, aircraft whose physical stru structure has been substantially changed, or really when anything big changes at all. So in Australia, as, a, as an Australian test pilot, it's generally not new aeroplanes because we don't build very many new aeroplanes here, but um, there's still plenty of interesting work to be done. And uh, I, I worked for two years as a full-time test pilot after getting back from school, and I've done most of the things I just listed. So I tested aeroplanes with new instruments in the cockpit, I tested aeroplanes with new stores and other new things stuck onto the outside and looked at aeroplanes that had been significantly structurally modified, and also um, basically worked as an aeroplane doctor, um, diagnosing some interesting behaviour in a particular aeroplane that, uh, that I'll show you after. So basically, um, a test pilot is an experimental scientist, and the new or modified aircraft is the lab for some fascinating experiments. And flight test runs almost exactly as you would expect a scientific experiment to run. So we use theory, knowledge and previous experience to predict what should happen and, uh, and come up with a plan. Um, we basically try and formulate the correct questions to answer through the flights and that's what we call a test plan. Uh, we then carry out the experiments and we do that by flying very specific manoeuvres called flight test techniques and then the data gets analysed, um, the conclusions get made and, and it gets reported on. So it sounds just like a normal scientific experiment, right? Now, in order to understand how aeroplanes are tested and why, um, a test pilot has to have an excellent knowledge of aeronautical engineering, which is where all that education and training comes in. Um, the other thing, and this is something I didn't fully appreciate until I got back here as a qualified test pilot, is you end up working as a translator. So the test pilot needs to be able to effectively communicate those conclusions and observations to engineers and then relate the engineering results back to pilots. So you end up working as a translator between those who design and build the aircraft and those who fly it on its missions. And while it will be easy and, uh, and attractive to hog all the glory, it's not, it's not all about the test pilots. Flight test is actually a team sport. So we do flight test in teams, uh, which include specially trained flight test engineers and system specialists, and, and those three groups of people, so the flight test engineers, the system specialists, and the test pilots, all have complementary skill sets. And it makes sense, right? We're trying to solve novel problems that nobody has seen before, so there is no such thing as a textbook solution. And if you're going to come up with a solution to a novel problem, you want as many different and complementary perspectives as you can get. So let's very briefly talk a little bit about the history of flight test. And then we'll talk about the science, which is more fun. So as long as there have been pilots, there have been test pilots. It's just that the really early pilots uh, were test pilots by default. And that's because when they designed and built their contraptions, there was nobody who was silly enough to strap into them and fly them. So they became designers, then engineers, then test pilots, then pilots. The first of them was this guy, uh, Otto Lilienthal, who lived in Germany between 1848 and 1896, and who was known at the time as the flying man, and I'm not going to attempt to say that in German because it would be awful. Um, he was the first person to make well-documented, repeated and successful flights, albeit in an umpired aircraft, so in a glider, and that's what effectively makes him the first test pilot. Uh, he was also around around the time um, that photography became more commonplace. So there were a lot of photographs, well, not by today's selfie standards, but by, but by contemporary standards, a lot of photographs of, of what he did. And this is one of the famous photographs of him flying one of his gliders off a hillside. Unfortunately, he died um, in a glider accident in uh, 1896. It was a pretty dangerous craft back then. Another famous example of designer, engineer, test pilot combination was uh, these guys, so the Wright brothers. And yes, they're most famous for that historic first flight of a heavier than air powered aeroplane in 1903, but um, they actually built, tested and flew lots of other aeroplanes over many, many years and carefully documented all of their experiments, uh, opening the doors to future aircraft development. And they designed and flew things that looked like this. Then as aircraft became more complex and more powerful through the early 20th century, and that also made them more dangerous, of course, it became apparent that in order to test them safely, you needed to educate people and train them specifically to do so. So the Empire Test Pilot School in England, which is the, the first test pilot school and the oldest one, opened its doors in 1943. 
and the United States Air Force Test Pilot School that I attended um, came around in 1944. And then as we began to flirt with the edges of known physics or, or then known physics, um, having those appropriately qualified people became even more important. And nothing is really a better example of that flirting with the edges of known physics than, uh, than this guy. So in the, in the 1930s and 1940s, um, many people thought that the sound, the speed of sound was actually in, an impenetrable barrier to controlled aeroplanes. So obviously we'd already done it with, uh, with ballistics, but uh, there were a lot of people who thought that uh, an aeroplane with flight controls couldn't go through it. Of course, they were proven wrong by uh, the man in the photo, Chuck Yeager, um, in 1947 over Edwards Air Force Base. And he did it in, uh, in this awesome aeroplane, the Bell X-1, which uh, he named Glamour Glamorous Glennis after his wife. And he also did it with two broken ribs, but that's another story. In the early days, uh, being a test pilot was actually a really dangerous business. So it was exciting, it was fun, uh, but it was also really dangerous. As late as the 1950s and 1960s, your probability of surviving a test pilot career was about two thirds. So what that actually meant was when you, when you sat there in your classroom at US Navy TPS, or United States Air Force TPS, you could lift, you look left and look right, and one of you three was unlikely to make it through your test pilot career. These days, it's thankfully much different to that. Um, and the reasons for that are a few. Um, we've made massive improvements in, uh, in modeling and simulation, which allow us to make much better predictions and come up with safer plans. Uh, we've also made big gains in telemetry and real-time monitoring, and, and this is where the whole team approach comes in. So this is a photo of a control room at the United States Air Force Test Pilot School, and all major test centres uh, in the world have control rooms that look like this. We have one at Edinburgh at the uh, Aircraft Research and uh, Development Unit. And when a test pilot is out flying a test sortie, his team of flight test engineers and system specialists sit in this room and they monitor flight parameters, uh, they direct the test, and, and they keep the pilots safe. So we've come a long way from those early pioneers. Um, it's less dangerous, but I think it's still just as cool. That's enough history because we're, uh, we're here to talk about science. And I'd like to share with you three things that I've experienced in the world of flight test um, that make my inner science nerd sing. Um, I mentioned earlier that flight test is basically conducting experiments in a, in a really cool lab, and the aircraft you're flying is that lab. So I'm going to show you one of the coolest airborne laboratories in the world, which I've been fortunate enough to fly a number of times. Um, this is the VISTA, um, and I'm going to actually read, because I'll get this wrong otherwise, uh, VISTA stands for Variable Stability In-Flight Simulator Test Aircraft. It's, it's not a very um, intuitive title, I think they just liked VISTA, and they came up with, uh, with words to fit that. It's, uh, a lot of you will recognise that as sort of an F-16. Uh, it is derived from a garden variety F-16, which uh, has then been heavily modified to turn it into an experimental aircraft and, uh, and an in-flight simulator. It has custom designed flight controls and a variable stability system. And uh, what that allows the guy in the rear cockpit to do is to tinker with a bunch of parameters and fundamentally change how the aircraft flies and behaves um, from moment one to moment two. So it can fly like a modern fighter, which you would expect, because that's what it is. Um, but it can also fly like a cargo plane. Um, you can make it fly like one of the Century Series aircraft, which had some weird and wonderful and, uh, and terrifying flight characteristics. And they can also make it fly like a space shuttle with a forward centre of rotation, which is just completely mind-blowing. So basically, the Vista is an aeroplane that, that will lie to you. And it taught me something really important um, that's sort of implied when you strap into an aeroplane that I didn't know I did. And what that is, is a bit of an unspoken contract. So. Uh, what I do, what I, what I now know I do when I strap into an aeroplane is I say to that aeroplane, hello aeroplane, I'm going to fly you nicely, I'm going to try and fly you within your, on, within your envelope, I'm going to try not to break you. And what I expect the aeroplane to say back to me is, OK, Maz, I'm going to respond the same way every time you put in a control input. And of course, in the Vista, you don't get that. You put in a control input, and it gives you a certain response. And then they do some magic in the back. And then you put in the same control input, and the aeroplane will depart. And that is, uh, that is profoundly disquieting for a pilot. And it gave me a whole new respect uh, for the aircraft. 
What we use the VISTA for, um, we use it to explore a whole bunch of flying characteristics. So if you don't have a variable stability aeroplane, you have to fly a number of different aeroplanes to see all those characteristics. With a variable stability aeroplane, you just tinker in the back and you can see a whole bunch of different flight characteristics in a single sortie. And what that lets you learn is what works and what doesn't. And here's a photo of me flying the Vista over the Californian high desert. And yes, that is a selfie. There is pretty much always time for a selfie. What you'll notice there is that uh, you can see one of my hands, the other one's clearly holding the camera, and that aircraft does not have an autopilot. <laughs> so let's talk some more science. Let's talk about control and out of control flight. So when most of us think about flying, we think about controlled flight. And, and what that means is that the aircraft is flying inside its uh, envelope and everything is nice and predictable. So every time the pilot puts in control inputs through their yoke or through their stick, the aeroplane responds the way it should. And everybody knows the joke, and sometimes the joke is used to sort of say how non-smart pilots are, you know, stick forward, houses get bigger, stick back, houses get smaller. That effectively describes what an aeroplane in control does. If you're a test pilot, that's pretty boring. Um, one of the bread and butter tasks of a, of a flight test program is to find out how an aeroplane behaves when it's out of control, when it stalls, when it auto-rotates, when it spins, or when it departs controlled flight uh, in, in any manner at all. At that point, the aircraft is not actually flying anymore. And I'll quote Buzz Lightyear here, at that point, you're basically just falling with style. Um, and the, the whole point of doing departure testing uh, is to work out when and how the aeroplane is going to depart, and more importantly, how you're going to get it back, back under control. So what we do as test pilots is we explore those out-of-control um, out control phenomena under controlled conditions, and they are really complex phenomena. So I'm not going to give you lots of equations, but I'll give you a taste. Um, this is what departure analysis looks like on paper. And these are just some of the parameters that need to be derived before you can start making a prediction about how the aeroplane is going to spin. Uh, and this is just a single slide out of a whole bunch about, uh, about departure analysis, but it sort of uh, it captures how complex the mathematics is. What's far more interesting is, is what it looks like in the aircraft. So the video I'm about to show you is a short snippet of some departure flight testing we did in an aircraft called the Fuga Magister, and that's the aircraft you see on the slide now. It's a, it's a French jet trainer from the 1950s with some very interesting flying characteristics. Um, you can see up there it's got a V-tail, uh, which uh, any aeroplane nerds up there will uh, automatically know means that it's got some very interesting spinning characteristics and that it doesn't particularly like recovering. Um, basically makes it a nightmare in, uh, in the spin. In fact, that V-tail on that aircraft is so much of an issue that uh, the designers actually included a keel on an aeroplane, right? It's supposed to be a boat thing. Um, on, the, on the rear part of the fuselage, you just can't see it in this photo uh, because of where, uh, where the wings are. So this is what out-of-control flight looks like in the Fuga Magister. And if I did have sound on this, we couldn't get the sound working, uh, you'd be able to hear the aeroplane creak and groan as if it's trying to break apart, because that's effectively what it is trying to do. Huh. We do have sound now. So what you saw there is a, is a stall, an induced one, an auto rotation, and then a fully developed spin. And, and if I was to play that again, and you were to watch for the airframe buffer, you can see the airframe basically trying to shake itself to pieces. And then, and then you saw a recovery. And the reason you would do those things over and over again, and then aggravate them, is to work out what works as a recovery, so then that can go into the flight manual for the young guys that come through, so they don't end up in a situation they can't recover. Um, Something I don't have video of because I wasn't allowed a camera in the aircraft, we also did uh, departure testing in the F-16. Now, the F-16 doesn't really spin. Uh, the F-16 departs in a, in a mode called uh, deep stall, which it kind of is quite comfortable when you're in that mode, although you're not in controlled flight, so you are quite literally falling with style. Um, you, you end up in this falling leaf 
um, mode where you are just slowly coming down, well, rapidly coming down, but, uh, but it's not particularly violent, so you don't feel like you need to uh, do anything about it necessarily straight up. Uh, but it's very difficult to pull the aeroplane out. Um, in fact, the, F6, the original F-16 didn't have a particular design feature that uh, they had to add in in order for the aeroplane to be pulled out of that departure mode. Um, and the way you pull the aeroplane out of the departure mode is you have to flick a switch and then you have to rock the stick in phase with the oscillations of the aeroplane. And if you rock the stick out of phase with those oscillations, you end up in a, in a worse and worse position. And uh, sometimes you can't tell what in and out of phase is because it's a matter of uh, fractions of a second. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting experience. Um, of course, the F-16 is designed not to depart still does every once in a while, but it's designed not to. So in order to, uh, in order to be able to do this kind of testing, we have to do a whole bunch of things that to, uh, to pilots who haven't done this sort of stuff before, as all of us were at that point, um, seem very, very counterintuitive. So we had to ballast, ballast the aeroplane so it was right in its aft centre of gravity limits. Then we had to take off and we had to feed, uh, feed fuel aft so it was well aft of, uh, of its centre of gravity limits. And that's basically the aeroplane engineers saying, hey, don't put yourself in this situation because you're likely to go out of control and not be able to recover. For the, for the testing side, we did that on purpose, then put the aeroplane out of control and then try to recover it. Uh, I wish I had video because, uh, particularly in the first one, I think I made like an excited little girl noise when we departed, like, wee! Um, and it, and it, was, it was quite an experience. I'll talk about one, one other thing, and we'll talk about wind tunnels, uh, both earthbound and flying. Um, so for those who don't know, wind tunnels are basically big tube-shaped facilities that allow engineers to move air over an object as if that object itself was flying. So they usually have big fans that, that do the air moving, and the object that's being tested is fixed in the, uh, in the middle or somewhere in the wind tunnel so it doesn't move. Um, then the air moving around the still objects um, shows you what would happen if the object was moving through the air. I hope that makes sense. So wind tunnels are commonly used to test scale models of vehicles, aircraft, spacecraft, or, or bits of spacecraft and aircraft. And some wind tunnels are actually big enough to hold whole vehicles. Um, this is a photo of one of the NASA wind tunnels with an aircraft model in it. Um, NASA has more wind tunnels than, than anybody else in the world. But um, most universities have one or two of their own. We can also study in detail in wind tunnels how the air moves around the object by injecting smoke or dye into the tunnel and then photographing the result. And this is, this is what that's showing you. So this is an airfoil in a wind tunnel. Um, airfoil is a section of a wing. And the idea here is to study the airflow around it at different angles of attack and then improve the airflow to increase its lift and decrease its drag. So that's all well and good um, when you have a wind tunnel and you have a model. But what do you do if you have an aerodynamic problem on a real live big aeroplane? Um, you don't have a model for it and you don't have a wind tunnel to go to. What we do, and this is something we did in as late as 2015, and I, when I actually proposed this, I couldn't believe they were actually going to do it. Um, we stick lots of bits of wool or other string onto the aeroplane. We take it flying and we take video of how that string behaves. Um, and then we analyze that afterwards. It's called tufting. It's been around for as long as aircraft have been tested, and it's still, um, it's still particularly effective. So in, uh, in 2015, uh, we had an airplane that was doing something a little bit strange, and we didn't really know what was, uh, what was happening uh, or what was causing the, uh, the aerodynamic phenomena we were seeing. So um, in the end, we ended up tufting it, and you can see one of the panels here. Um, and I flew it while we recorded the patches of tufting in flight. So I'll show you a couple of pieces of footage uh, in a minute, but first to situate your appreciation of, of how we took that footage. So I'm flying the P3. I'm holding the P3 in a dive between 300 and 350 knots, so topping out at about 650 k's an hour. And uh, my good friend, um, Jason Diulis of Jubs is flying a Hornet, which is the only other aircraft in the inventory that's going to fly fast enough to take this footage at uh, not very far from my P3 at all different angles to, uh, to take the footage. So we basically turned the P3 into a wind tunnel. I'll show you a couple of, a couple of videos. So note what the little bits of string are doing. And have a think about just how close that Hornet has to be.
And then the next one, he's sitting right under me, and I'm in a dive. What position? Next to 37, morning. Identify, they can, you can resume your own nav. Uh, Edward 359 at 21, confirm that stress point. You got it. Got it. <laughs> and you can hear him talking to the photographer. So if anybody had told me at the end of my uh, test pilot school training that I would end up tufting a P3 close to the end of its life and then fly in information with a Hornet to get tufting footage, I would have said, Pfft. No, there's no way we'll be doing that, and it just shows just how unpredictable the flight desk world is. This was one of the this was one of the coolest things I've done um, in terms of just being out of left field and us going right back to basics, uh, to that basic science to answer some difficult questions. So. I could talk about aeroplanes all day, uh, but I won't. So uh, I'll leave you with that, and, and I'll just leave you with the thought, particularly for the, for the youngins um, out there, that you can be a massive science nerd, um, and you can still do some really, really cool stuff. Um, and there are plenty of jobs out there that combine the two, and I've been very, very fortunate to have one of them.